Hi, welcome back to Videos from the Ville. This is Professor Greenwalt in uh, Public Administration, and uh, uh, today we want to talk about public policy making. Now, there are many um, um, books written on public policy making, many courses that are offered, uh, but we can boil it all down uh, to just a few slides for you. I think we boiled this down to four, four separate slides. Um, when we look at public policy and we want to try to understand how it's, uh, how it's made, Grover Starling spent many years studying all of the um, theories that he could find, uh, all the ideas <clears throat> that uh, he could uh, encounter about how public policy was made, and he was able to pull together all these theories and ideas uh, into one uh, neat and tidy graphic that shows uh, how he believes that uh, public policy is made. Uh, he certainly believes that public policy should be viewed as living cyclical entities. They have no apparent beginning, they have no apparent end. Um, but if you look on your slide, uh, you can see the five elements that he believes are important uh, in the development of public policy. He says first that we uh, identify our needs. We recognize whatever needs we have. Uh, after we recognize our needs in public policy, we formulate uh, policy ideas that might um, take care of those. Uh, after that, uh, we uh, decide which ones we're going to adopt, which ones we're going to adopt in the uh, Congress. And then after Congress decides which ones they want to adopt, uh, then we go to program operations. They uh, let the bureaucracy take over uh, the ideas that they had uh, put into law. And finally, as the programs are operating, uh, after some period of time, they need to be evaluated. Are they working or are they not? When the evaluation is done, the results of the evaluation come back to the bureaucracies and the program operations. Do they need to be improved? Do they need to be changed? And if so, you know, is uh, legislation required? And that goes back to uh, the legislature and adoption. And sometimes that will uh, lead to the formulation of new ideas regarding this area of public policy and the identification of new needs, and that cycle just continues and goes around and around. So this is Grover Starling's idea of public policy, and this is based on a review of all of the literature on public policy making. Now, what has traditionally been true about public policy making uh, is that there have been, uh, there's been one model that uh, has stood out over the years. Um, we don't know who the father is, we don't know who the mother is, we don't know what year it was developed. I remember encountering it in fourth grade uh, as I grew up uh, as an explanation why public policy is developed the way it is. And this is called the Iron Triangle concept. The Iron Triangle concept says that all public policy is made uh, through an interaction between Congress, between bureaucrats in the government organizations, and lobbyists in the, um, in the general public. And it's this interaction between congressmen, between bureaucrats and lobbyists uh, that uh, end up uh, creating, molding, generating public policy the way that we uh, have it. So that's one of the most uh, one of the most um, long-standing uh, theories about the development of public policy. We find that uh, Hugh Hecklow, uh, who was uh, at uh, Harvard. Um, in 1978, Hugh Hecklow said, well, there are other ways that public policy comes about as well, and they were quite apparent. No one had done a lot of writing about this. Uh, but in 1978, Hugh Hecklow came out with a description of issue networks. Issue networks uh, had another name. Uh, we have the Iron Triangle. 
Now we have the sloppy large hexagon. We have the sloppy large hexagon because what we did is we kept the iron triangle and we added three more vertices to it. Uh, Hugh Hecklow said there are some public policy issues that are very controversial, very hot, if you will, and therefore other groups of individuals and institutions become involved as well. Uh, for example, uh, the mass media, for example, the presidency or the president, uh, for example, the general public. So those are the three additional in, in, um, uh, groups that are involved. Uh, so you would have the Congress, you have the bureaucracy, you have the interest groups, but now because we're dealing with very controversial public policy issues, uh, the mass media is there, the mass media is involved, the mass media covers it. They get the general public involved. They're very interested in it and they want to participate as well. And finally, the president, him or herself, gets involved as well. So we find that issue networks are another way of explaining why and how uh, public policy is developed the way that it is. And what's true about uh, the Iron Triangle, and something that I need to go back and mention, is with the Iron Triangle, one thing that's interesting is that the participants in that triangle are very stable. Uh, there's great stability in the Iron Triangle. The people that occupy those congressional committees, the people that are in the bureaucracies, uh, sometimes even the lobbyists, they stay for, they could stay for a generation. They know each other well and uh, they don't change very often. Now the sloppy large hexagon, members of, for example, the president will change every four to eight years, members of the general public participating will change, and the mass media members will change. So Issue Network's membership is far more fluid, obviously. Well, so we have then with Hugh Hecklow, we had uh, Iron Triangles and we had Issue Networks. Finally, uh, the last contribution was made in 1969. Uh, Emmett Redford wrote Democracy in the Administrative State. Democracy in the Administrative State uh, in 1969 was another contribution here. And what he did was he tried to say we can put together the uh, Iron Triangle and we'll call it intermediary politics. We can put together the issue networks and we'll call it macro politics or sloppy large hexagons. And then if we're going to complete the full picture of public policy making, uh, we can insert micro politics. And micro politics uh, were not talked about or uh, looked at up till that time. Micro politics are narrow one on one requests, narrow one on one requests that are made of government officials. And they can come from an individual, they can come from a company, they can come from a community. And what's true about narrow one-on-one -on -one requests or micropolitics is uh, when a, um, uh, a request comes in uh, to a congressman, for example, or congressional staff, that these requests do not engage countervailing interests. This is a request by the Lions Club to a local congressman the congressman for a uh, flag that's flown over the national capital to be auctioned at a, um, a charity event in the upcoming, uh, in the upcoming month. Uh, no one's going to object to that. No one's going to argue about that. So Emmett Redford talks about this third area of public policy. Yes, we have macro politics or sloppy large hexagons. We have intermediary politics or iron triangles. Now we have micropolitics or narrow one-on-one -on -one requests that, that we shouldn't let those out in the big picture of looking at public policy making. So Emmett Redford gives us something else to think about and completes our uh, discussion, if you will, our investigation in the public policy making. So those are the three um, basic uh, models to consider when looking at public policy making. And that wraps up uh, this particular discussion. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, PowerPoints very carefully, uh, they'll explain uh, this uh, to you even better. Um, if you have any questions on it, 
please don't hesitate to email me. Please don't hesitate uh, to call me or FaceTime me uh, or text me. I'm happy to take any communications from all you guys, okay? All right, and that handles public policy making. Uh, I'm going to uh, sign off here and we'll be 